I am Robin Devreller Avail, uh, filling in for Naruto for today uh, because of certain reasons he couldn't join. So uh, glad to have you all with us. Um, just to introduce our speakers, our guests for the day, we have James from Subquery, Ayush, uh, co founder of uh, Layer Edge, Sneh, uh, Sneh uh, co founder of Helix Labs. Um, yeah, so um, GM, everyone, how are you guys doing? I guess uh, we're doing well, doing well. Um, <laughs> I think uh, fantastic, it's a, yeah. It's a great time to be in Web3. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think it's good uh, to have a, a week-long break after the chaos that was last week's ECC. I don't know if you guys were at there, but, like, I don't know if you lost your voice or um, I know much of my team is sick now, but it's, like, thousands of people in small rooms constantly talking to each other. Um, pretty crazy. Like COVID never existed. <laughs> <laughs> like the good old days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, ETC was quite a vibe. I'd, I'd say, like, it, it was just crazy. Um, like, it's so many events out there, so many people. It was just great. Um, yeah. Um, did did you guys also go? Like, Ayush, were you also there at? Uh, I actually uh, opted out. I went to ETH Denver. I went to Token 2049 in Dubai. Uh, just time to kind of grind and uh, work on our product a little bit more. And then I'll be going to probably uh, 2049 in, in Singapore um, later this year. So, yeah, uh, I didn't make it to ETH CC this time. Yeah, like on my side, like I was a little bit ill. So I decided like not to go anywhere. Ah, cool. No worries. Uh, I mean, I, I guess we'll see you guys at uh, Token 24 Nights in Singapore or like DEFCON maybe. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that's totally cool. Um, yeah, but so let's jump right into it, right? Um, I think let's just start with introductions. Let's just go around the table here. Give uh, like, I want you guys to just give a quick intro about yourselves, what you guys are doing, what you guys are working on. And uh, I mean, yeah, just just give that uh, one minute pitch about yourselves. Ms. Sneh, if you want to start. Sure, yeah. Uh, hey, my name is Sneh Bhatt. Um, I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Helix Labs. Um, what Helix Labs does is really break into the modular blockchain ecosystem and provide interoperability and uh, composability um, for a lot of these uh, fragmented liquidity on on L2s and L3s. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm based in uh, New York, um, been in the crypto space uh, since 2016, 2017. Started mining Bitcoin back in uh, 2012. So, um, you know, <laughs> really, really uh, old time, lost money on Mt. Gox. So you can kind of see where my head's at, um, being a little bit skeptical about uh, <laughs> blockchain and crypto um, centralization. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that that's great. Um, James. Yeah, sure. Hey, I'm James Bailey. I'm the CEO of Subquery. We're a, a data indexer and a RPC, a decentralized RPC company. Essentially, we just do decentralized infrastructure. I guess you could categorize it as. Um, I've been around the space for the last five years. I didn't lose money in Mt. Gox, thankfully. I've lost money in a few other places, like we all have. Uh, FTX was the one that screwed me a little bit, um, as well as uh, a Terra Luna. Um, in fact, um, we even went to an event with Duquan about a week before the collapse, which was a uh, fantastic timing um, in Singapore. Uh, so yeah, it's been um, it's a pleasure being on here, and I'm looking forward to talking about um, a few different things we run in for. Yeah, I, sh I should. Yeah, uh, and hi everyone, like I'm Ayush, I'm the co-founder of Leverage. So we are basically the settlement layer on Bitcoin. So like we say like we can settle anything on Bitcoin if you want uh, from data to anything that you require. So like uh, majorly we deal in like uh, a majority in the like Bitcoin L2 space. And uh, like we have something called aggregated proofs by which we can actually bring the cost of these uh, settlements down by 10 folds. 
which I think is will be the like most cutting edge in the industry standard. And like a little bit about myself. So like I started my like crypto journey in 2018, just after like I uh, like immediately uh, I was like uh, tinkering around a small project inside Samsung, specifically on the crypto side. Like majorly my work was on the account side. If you have used any of the Samsung devices, uh, the I was part of the team that designed all the authentications for that. So uh, I had a like pretty much interest in that. And then I went to like Gnosis, I worked a little bit on crypto. Uh, specifically on like sequencers, indexers, and then I started like Clear Edge. So it's like a pretty fun journey. And on the money side, yeah, I was also the guy who lost like a lot of money in like the, when the USD crashed. Because, uh, yeah, we all believed like uh, that 20% is for like a little longer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we all suffered a bit there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did you lose money in, Robin? Uh, a bit of everything i think uh let's just say polka dot was not one of my wisest investments <laughs> yeah uh, I, I mean uh, uh, the way i said it like uh i wasn't saying like uh you know basically why i said hey like i even lost money on mount Cox was just to show like the the highlights and, and worries of of centralization and why everyone should start decentralizing everything, you know? <laughs> centralized, centralized, uh, centralized exchanges and centralized uh, 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 ecosystems uh, are, are doomed to fail. That's, that's why we're all in this space, right? <laughs> I totally agree with you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think, uh, we most of us might you know about the ongoing situation with wasrex maybe like that is i guess yeah. the most recent hack that kind of happened like it just happened today i think today or yesterday i guess but yeah it's it's, it's the one it's one of the most recent centralized exchange attacks that i've seen um but yeah i mean that's definitely true that we want we want to decentralize the space that's why we're here um so like bring me bring that brings me to my next question right um when we're talking about we're building the infrastructure for web3 we're building this decentralized infrastructure um what do you think this what do you think the space currently looks like right we have a lot of tools already we've got a lot of infra already uh to in your perspective what does it look like uh, and what is like the missing puzzle or like what's the last that what's that missing puzzle piece that is uh you know what could potentially bring us to like a mass adoption or would be at least be the key to helping develop build applications that can bring the mass adoption that we are all like looking for right um yeah if anyone wants to take that start this one um we look at um the infrastructure tools out there. Um, let's say you're building a new decentralized application. Let's say it's a smart contract application on, um, say, Polygon, for example, Avail, um, and uh, you'll use various different services. So, for example, you might have a front end that might be a mobile app, or it might be a website um, or web app using React. Um, that would inter interact with the the, the the blockchain itself. So that will go through generally an RPC. Um, that's a core piece of infrastructure that every application generally uses. Um, you might need to get some more aggregated data to show in your application. Um, that would use something like an indexer. Um, you might then also use some off-chain storage. For example, don't store large balance information on blockchain, it's a dumb idea. Um, you might store stuff um, on IPFS or some other um, service, or you might be using an S3 bucket um, to source information like, like images, metadata, other stuff like that. It's too bulky to go on the chain. You might use oracles to retrieve data um, from the real world onto your smart contracts and into your application. And then finally, you might also use some decentralized compute. Let's say you have some more computationally expensive stuff. Um, let's say, imagine you're building a game. At the end of the game, you want to kind of calculate and kind of like do some summation of, of the scores and stuff. You might use some decentralized compute. Um, now, there's three, there's five pieces, RPCs, indexes, um, decentralized storage, decentralized compute, and uh, oracles. 
for four of those five, everything except oracles, a lot of developers these days are still using centralized services. And I think you kind of, there's a famous like XKCD comic, which is like showing like the internet and the internet is built by all these things. And one little corner, there's this tiny fragile component that's, that's like managed by some open source developer. And I guess you can kind of copy that for Web3 and say that little tiny fragile part is all these centralized solutions that these decentralized applications rely on today. Um, there are so many decentralized applications, and I say decentralized, that are completely and utterly reliant on a centralized product or service out there. And of course, that means that it can be turned off at any point in time. It means that it's susceptible to outages. There's always outages. Um, it means that you are at the women control and can be, can, you know, you, you know, you, your data can be kind of tracked or monitored by a third party. So I think personally, we're getting to a point where there are a bunch of decentralized alternatives. They may not be as good or as easy or as fast as essentialized ones, but I think we're getting to a point now where there's a kind of a developer education part that we need to focus on to kind of move to these decentralized alternatives. I completely agree with you. Um, and on that on that end, uh, you know, the, the three major problems I really see is probably um, lack of user-based applications. I mean, consumer-based applications in the crypto space, um, interoperability, uh, just so many VMs, so many L3s. Um, recently, I met uh, a layer, a company claiming to be a layer five, which is, I didn't even know layer fours were a thing yet. So kind of, uh, you know, a lot of infra play being there and then um, uh, fragmented liquidity. So obviously it's it's very hard to stream liquidity and, and bring liquidity to all these different VMs and layer threes. Um, I think that that's a big hurdle that the crypto space, it kind of ties in with interoperability, but um, it, it's a big hurdle um, for infra layer projects. Um, especially when trying to garner support or liquidity uh, throughout the blockchain or, or Web3 ecosystems. Yeah, totally. And I have like a first-hand experience, like uh, at Layer Edge, like initially we started with like building our own Layer 2. And like getting the developers was hard, but like we were able to crack it. But like getting the users in, getting the liquidity in, that's like a pretty tough sell. Uh, like for any anyone like why anyone will, would like to like specifically use any specific chain so the fragmentation of liquidity is like a pretty hard nut to crack like uh, like you have to have like a lot of incentives and also like uh, i also feel like the incentivization system in crypto has also like also needs to adapt a little uh, so like we can uh, basically incentivize like real users than like uh, a lot of like farmers that are coming in because right now uh, everything is quite gamified here so that that's not like something that's just, uh, that's an immediate uh, sell, but like we need to focus on like creating some kind of real world use cases where like uh, every like mom and pops can use it. Yeah, I agreed. Agreed there. Um, yeah, on that topic of fragment fragmentation, right? Um, it's it seems like we all agree that is the issue of fragmentation um but we also want to build aggregation tools for this liquidity we want to build unification tools as well right um but at this point we're also seeing a lot of different ecosystems building up their own ecosystems for aggregation for unifying liquidity unifying uh you know different aspects of their ecosystem right what is your maybe take on that uh is there is there a take on that for you guys and so the, the question was uh fulfilling um uh fulfilling uh fragmented liquidity across the space and like what's our uh take on that is that was that the just clarifying that um yeah i mean like Obviously, uh, one uh, one of the aspects of the question is obviously what's your take on the uh, fragmented liquidity part. And the other question was, uh, we see multiple projects trying to bring in their own solutions, sometimes siloed for their ecosystems, maybe sometimes not. Um, what is your take on those approaches? Like, uh, 
uh, for example, we've got Aglia, we've got Superchains, we've got other solutions as well, right? Uh, they're trying to aggregate different uh, ecosystems together, trying to aggregate liquidity. Like, what's what's your take on this aggregation ecosystem that we are starting to build out? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, so, you know, over at Helix Labs this is actually one of our our biggest challenges and one of the, one of the things that we're trying to solve here. Um, so fragmented liquidity um, is obviously a very, very big issue, especially uh, with the advent of, of Arbitrum and Optimism um, and the modular ecosystems in general. Um, so we're basically, our target is to onboard liquid stake tokens uh, and then restake them, uh, utilizing different LRTs in the space. We're doing this by means of uh, within our own vault ecosystem and of course what we're calling an omni dm abs um, which essentially allows uh pooled liquidity or, or streaming pooled liquidity from other l2s to other l3s um and one thing i'd like to really drive home is like uh like evm is great um but there's so many other vms out there and so many other l2s and l3s out there so we have to think beyond just uh uh EVM compatibility, right? Whether it be Eclipse or Movement Labs or, uh, you know, with their Move VM or Eclipse with the Solana VMs or uh, Mega ETH with their paralyzed EVMs. I think that's really, really critical when it comes to uh, enabling fragmented liquidity or liquidity in general to move from one ecosystem to another and from one uh, settlement layer to another. I think, uh, you know, especially working with Avail and uh, and other DAs, I think that's uh, incredibly important to to uh, essentially bring this entire modular ecosystem to a little bit more of a cohesive point. Utilizing liquid staking and liquid restaking, I think, is kind of uh, low hanging fruit. I mean, because who doesn't want to earn yield, right? I mean, that's uh, I feel like it's it's becoming more and more prevalent that. Uh, to be adept at Web3, you have to understand uh, what restaking and staking is in general. And um, yeah, that's one of the ways that we're, we're solving it at Helix Labs. It may very well, like it's, it's potentially an unpopular answer, but it may very well be that there are too many projects trying to do the same thing in this space. And as a result, liquidity, the finite liquidity has been split across too many things right um and i guess part of that's driven by investors investors will kind of dictate a little bit about what they want to see in terms of development of the market uh, investors are big on layer twos are big on um zk rollups right now they're big on infrastructure products and they're big on um today they're big on ai right anything that's had ai in the name gets investor money and that's why you're seeing a huge number of these projects starting up doing the same thing and distributing and splitting the liquidity between them um in terms of your other your other point robin you asked a point around fragmentation of, of infrastructure i we're kind of lucky that um blockchain ecosystem is largely kind of grouped around two different um smart contract kind of technologies is it obviously the ebm stuff um and then we're seeing a lot of other chains, I think, build Rust-based Bosom contracts or, or contract languages. Um, there are a few other weird ones, of course, but um, for the for the kind of the theme of it, those are the two kind of um, smart contract languages. And the best thing is that a lot of infrastructure tools works um, very similarly across both of those um, kind of smart contract frameworks. Um, and it means that a developer working um, on one EVM network, or one EVM layer one or layer two, we'll probably be able to do the same contracts and use the same technology and the same infrastructure on another one. And that's a big benefit um, that teams have in the space. Uh, on this thing, I think uh, Sne and James covered like most of the points. Like uh, how I see this is uh, more of like uh, a dance between the centralization and decentralization aspects. The thing is like, uh, uh, like what you can say, uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, projects are coming and that will actually uh, 
like split the liquidity but uh, for uh, getting the uh, common liquidity we are getting aggregation platforms and hence like uh, the liquidity centralized to like few different platforms and then there will be like multiple different aggregation platforms to again like split the liquidity so like in the whole space like uh, what actually is the whole game is like uh, basically there should be some good amount of competition between different players so that uh, there is like very low risk of like monopolization of any specific part but on the front on the super chain and uh, specifically on like how the polygon is getting the ag layer i'm like a pretty much support of both because whenever like anyone wants to start a, like a new chain the liquidity is the biggest barrier and like these two uh, like uh, aggregation platforms actually help uh, the chains a lot and that can actually help like small development teams to come up with a like a novel chain uh, like i don't think it will be majorly used for like general purpose chain but it has a lot of scope for like app based chains or like specific like utility based chains uh, there it can have like a really uh, great use case that is interesting interesting um Okay, so in in I so like in terms of layer ledge, right? Uh, as far as I can see, you have uh, like you guys are building on Bitcoin. Uh, you want to basically have all of the L2s and the L3s, all of them basically settle on Bitcoin, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, so, like, given your conviction in the in the Bitcoin thesis, right? Do you anticipate that in the future that all L2s are going to be, uh, you know, settling on Bitcoin uh, or like at least uh, these newer ones would shift to a Bitcoin first approach as opposed to Ethereum. If yes, why? Uh, like, why would they make that switch? Yeah, so uh, like uh, our thesis and our conviction is like uh, the ecosystem on the Bitcoin side is like bound to grow. And the like main reason is the liquidity that, that we are talking about. Uh, on the Ethereum side, like there's great liquidity and great smart contract. Everything works perfectly, but there is like pretty high like competition and there are like really big players who are competing in that market. If you see how uh, the Bitcoin L2 space, it's more like what Ethereum was in 2018-19. So it's like a budding space. It's pretty much growing and it can grow at a like, really fast rate because like still uh, like the Bitcoin is not live and like uh, you can, are not able to tap in the liquidity that much. So as like the, the hardcore Bitcoiners get like relatively used to like working with smart contracts, like getting some good amount of yields, then there is like close to like $1.2 trillion of asset that, is, that, that can be unlocked. I'm not saying completely 100% will be unlocked. Say 50% gets unlocked then it's like a $600 billion market. But like before that actually happens, there are a, a lot of infrastructure that has to be built because on the like regular like smart contract side, like on other chains, uh, they like I've heard like there are a lot of like overbuilt infra, but on the Bitcoin side, there's actually an underbuilt infra. So right now, like uh, like that we started with like an L2, and then we figured out like what is happening on the Bitcoin space is like there are a lot of like Bitcoin L2s coming up, but they are not attached to Bitcoin in any sense. Neither they are doing any kind of transaction settlement on Bitcoin or any data settlement on Bitcoin. So that's why like we tried to focus on like the data settlement part because on the transaction settlement like bitvm and rgb plus plus guys are working a, ter a terrific job so what we thought like once they go live then what specific things are like will be like required then so then we figured out okay we can work on transaction settlement and we were developing that for our chain so we modelized it and like uh, we immediately got like a very good response from specifically the developer community and the guys who are building on like bitcoin l2s and that's how like we decide okay like we can we can double down on here right um so you already mentioned something that i was gonna ask as a follow-up question here right like you mentioned most bitcoin l2s at this point uh even though you call them an l2 it's basically like a side chain that is running parallelly with bitcoin maybe maybe doing some checkpointing along the way on bitcoin um what do you have to say about that is that going to be the case forever um or what what changes do you think uh are going to take place in this space and if you can give me a hot take on the state of bitcoin l2s or l2s in general like all of you guys like anything give me a hot take about l2s that you think uh that you want to give in this platform right now i mean specifically about bitcoin l2s i think uh you know, uh, 
if you've been around long enough to to kind of have the whole rootstock debacle kind of unfold and have that promise of of l2s uh bitcoin l2s um really shoved in your face but nothing really come out of it for three four years until you know these new players started entering the space like in 2022 and beyond um you know i think you know for me specifically i had to take a step back and look and not be so judgmental and realize that there is so much trap liquidity whether whether we're talking about merlin that already has two and a half billion dollars of tbl um or babylon which is uh doing a lot of great things in bitcoin ecosystems like for example bitcoin staking or thing people like bob that uh work we're actually working with all three of these uh companies uh that have built a have built a wrapped bitcoin uh evm ecosystem layer um that kind of helps uh, facilitate bitcoin um to be used in DeFi. um so i think i think in general i think l2s are the answer to the scalability issue. I think Ethereum, I mean, Bitcoin's never gonna be changed. And I, and I think, especially when it comes to maxis, they like the finality of that, that, okay, Bitcoin is not gonna change. There's no block size changes. Um, it's very slow to move, but it's also very slow to have any exploits, right? So I think uh, specifically on the Bitcoin L2 area, I think everyone should be really keeping a close eye on it. Um, and uh, see what it can do to help, you know, essentially this dwindling liquidity or dwindling interest in DeFi and unlock a lot more liquidity. So uh, I don't think there's much I can add here, right? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ayush. Yeah, you can go ahead, James. No, I think there's not much I can add, right? Like, it's, it's interesting how Bitcoin layer tokens are going to come through recently in the past, like, six months but i understand why right like um a lot of people have bitcoin and like the amount of liquidity on bitcoin is is dwarfs everything else um and uh providing a bit more value to that than just holding is um a very attractive proposition um so unlocking that liquidity be used in a more interactive way i think is going to do a lot of benefit to the ecosystem uh, totally, I like I agree with like uh, James and uh, stay on that. Uh, I just want to like uh, like answer the question that like Robin asked like on the specific like infrastructure side, like uh, the specific reason like uh, like one of one of the reason like why like uh, a lot of guys were actually not doing any kind of settlement on Bitcoin was also the cost aspect. Like uh, as we started doing some kind of data, data settlement on Bitcoin, so if you just uh, post the proofs of it like not exactly the complete data but just a proof of it so uh bitcoin blocks like they're they, they like basically like six blocks uh every hour and if you just compute like a, a 20 10, 10 to 20 dollar transaction fees which is a standard fees if you're pushing any like small amount of proof so the cost closed uh, came close to around like one billion dollars and which is like quite big for any of the like new infra players or new chains that are coming which are not that well funded so they're big players who can spend a lot of money for the uh, data settlement part. But if the costs are pretty high, then it, they, it creates an incentive for not doing that path and just working uh, a, a workaround. So like for that, we uh, came up with something called aggregated proofs. So like we have multiple different clients. So we can aggregate their proofs and post in a single proof. So that's by like trying to bring the cost down by tenfold. So I think a million dollars is pretty high for a like budding new chain to pay annually for doing the settlement on Bitcoin. But uh, if it's reduced to say hundred thousand dollars, that's close to like eight thousand dollars a month. That's still little achievable for them. So we're trying to bring the cost down, and we made our whole architecture and everything modular, so that they do not need to change anything on their part and we can directly attach to like uh, multiple different stacks so like right now like we have a partnership with like arbitrum like uh, not exactly a partnership like we've attached to the arbitrum and they're supporting us with uh, multiple different efforts like dev efforts and all the efforts and uh, we are right now in the process of like integrating with like the uh, op uh, like uh, specifically the uh, optimism and trying to work with like polygon cdk also so that like uh, we can bring the major stacks to the Bitcoin world, because right now we see what is actually happening is people are trying to 
uh, do the modified version of the old stacks and trying to run a new chain here. So we decided, okay, we can just uh, try to partner with them or try to uh, like take some help on the development side and try to uh, make our like uh, whole stacks compatible with like, all the famous stacks. So if a new uh, developer or a new builders are trying to create a new chain, uh, the onboarding process is quite smooth for them. And when it's coming to like uh, the maxis in the Bitcoin ecosystem, then like uh, we are working with like uh, the new bit, which is like the preferred like DA on like the Bitcoin side. Like uh, this is like a thing that's still in progress, but yeah, we are very close to uh, closing the deal there. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Um, so let's just uh, take a step back from the Bitcoin space, right? Let's uh, Let's move into what infrastructure actually is supposed to enable right um and that is consumer applications right we need consumer applications as the end goal um at least to me that is what we need to be enabling as infrastructure projects um so james um i, I think i want to direct this question to you because as like subquery is like an indexer it is one of the primary tools that you know most applications would be using in order to like you know query stuff from the chain and to like uh, build applications that in, in a way that is developer friendly user friendly etc right um so from your perspective um how has the infrastructure uh landscape changed for developers so far and um what's missing for them and do we need uh, what kind of consumer applications do we need to uh, to see built today well, it's nice said something at the start of this, which is that we kind of just need fundamentally more consumer applications, right? Like um, the number of consumer applications is way too low. And I'm in the point, which is that investors drive what people build these days and investors aren't finding consumer applications sexy for some weird reasons. Um, I think that's detrimental to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, in terms of the landscape, I think, as I said, I think it's, I think it's actually pretty good. Um, I think we just need to be aware that um, my biggest point I made in the start of the call was around the decentralization alternatives or the decentralized alternatives that exist. Um, you know, at, at, at Subquery, we do a lot of work in terms of providing decentralized alternatives to both uh, indexes and indexer hosting, as well as IFBCs. Uh, and that's been a big drive of ours, is that we think you can uh, viably replace centralized components in your application, which is the entire um, meaning behind Web3 is what we try to do every day, okay? Um, in terms of other things, I wouldn't say there's there's areas which are, there's obvious gaps or holes with, with um, infrastructure. There is, you know, things are still slightly less reliable than what they should be, um, but that's part of the, the, the joy of working on technology which is constantly changing. Um, a new version is constantly being created and, and deployed. And um, we're still building these layers uh, of the Cortex stack on top of each other. Um, so it's a very immature um, kind of bedrock that you're building a house on here. Um, so understandably, um, you know, there's been some teething issues in the past, um, but it's getting better every day um, and every week. And um, I do think there is no kind of glaring hole um, in terms of the infrastructure landscape at this point in time. But you guys might have different views on that. Yeah, I think, uh, it, especially when it comes to uh, consumer applications, when it comes to, you know, what's the initial problem with consumer applications? It's onboarding, right? There's no way of of easily onboarding assets onto a digital platform, you know, such as converting dollars into USDT or Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, and then, of course, the lack of applications such as, you know, real world assets or gaming or, um, you know, uh, betting, uh, such as sports betting. There's a lot of things that are really lacking here because, you know, when I think, OK, Gen X or, or Boomer, uh, I understand it's like millennials and Gen Z were a little bit more um, open to the idea of things like decentralized compute, but that's not what 99% of the people are really going to use cryptocurrency for, right? Um, 
but they would use it in things like gaming or betting or real world asset transfers or digital identity. Um, so there is a severe lack uh, of of assets there uh, of or consumer applications in general. Um, you know, uh, one thing that we're doing at Helix Labs is once you onboard the assets, you know, you want to earn interest and and play around play around with DeFi ecosystems and have interoperability and and earn rewards, earn yield. So that's the problem that we're really focusing. But I think it all ties into, uh, you know, uh, trying to support the, the consumer applications of this broad term modular ecosystems of L2s and L3s that are, uh, you know, for example, if there's gaming on Polygon, it's it's hard to get into Polygon when you're just a Coinbase user, right? Or, or, or don't even have a MetaMask. Or if there is a Bitcoin L2 ordinal, um, you know, ordinals like uh, they're they're tricky and expensive. You know, some people are spending three to four hundred dollars in in quote unquote gas or Bitcoin fees um, just to just to mint one of these things for uh, any sort of Bitcoin gaming. So it, it is it is uh, it is challenging, and I think um, uh, the space is still very young. And I think uh, the more it matures, the more people understand that there is underlying utility. Um, in in consumer applications, and uh, we'll bring those to the forefront rather than um, just solely relying on L2s and L1s and L3s being built out. But really, we need the the utility of the consumer applications. Yeah, the consumer application, I totally agree with you. Like uh, because like the end user is always going to interact with a like specific app that he loves to work with. Like either it's, it will be a game or it will be any of kind of DeFi app that he's earning the interest in. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the, I agree with all of your points, but the real question here still remains, right? Is the reason we don't have adoption or you know the killer app as one would say is it a tech issue is it some other issue is it maybe a regulatory issue is it a, a maybe we don't have enough talented devs in this ecosystem issue what what's the actual issue here guys uh, i think it's a i think it's a management issue there is no reason there is no reason why big companies like blizzard or um, you know, DraftKings or um, Facebook and Google should not be utilizing Web3 assets in terms of digital identity or e-commerce payment systems or or uh, digital assets like skins on games. Why they shouldn't be integrating that? I think, I think, uh, as you know, as, as we are probably part of the younger generation here, we're more open to that idea. And we're we were kind of born into it natively, but I think that management across these traditional large players, you know, like like Google and and uh, Facebook or sorry Meta these days, or, or even Twitter. I mean, Twitter's trying to make leaps and strides. Or, sorry, X. Uh, all these name changes. <laughs> X is trying to make uh, all these leaps and strides, but still, there's there's no native integration, right? There's still very little. Uh, uh integration with digital assets in general and I, so i don't think it's a tech issue i think the tech is there i think the the uh dev talent pool is incredible i think you know some of the smartest devs i've ever, like ever are in this space right now um but I, I really think it's just an adoption adoption issue and, and upper management really fearing their bottom line yeah uh I totally agree with that. Like it's more of an adoption issue. Like uh, if you like, I just want to go back to the memory lane of like the dot com bubble. Uh, if you see in the two thousand, there was an app called Town Hall, which is exactly what Facebook does now. It was a social media app, but like most of the features, pretty similar. So the thing was like the adoption was low at that time because the internet frequency, like uh, speed, were pretty slow, and there were less users on uh, specifically on the internet. Right now, as like a uh, we uh, on the crypto ecosystem like people are getting more educated they're coming on board they're trying to learn and adopt the ecosystem so it will take little time but like it will start slowly but at the uh, inflection point it will go in a s curve 
so we are just waiting for that specific s curve and once that hits like most of the big corporations will also try to jump in because there will be a big money to be made by them yeah it's a great point right like um i think you kind of alluded to the point that like usability is still not there um you know for town hall what was a time and um and the usability of the dot com bubble kind of era internet was pretty horrendous um almost similar to what the usability is for the average person um in the in the, in the current state um of web3 um so maybe it's a time run that um if we looked at if we classified all the infrastructure as also like um user infrastructure like um make it easy for you know to for the regular person to 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 create a wallet and interact with things then yes we're we're sorely missing stuff um there's a big product market fit in our industry um people build things that they think is valuable but that might not be the most valuable in terms of the global view uh it's like a local optimum versus a a global optimum um and as a result we're still using pretty horrible um wallet experiences um exchanges still suck bridges are still uh, really suck sending a transaction to someone else gives me like anxiety still today and i've done it thousands of times um you know like there's all these like and like everywhere in the corner like you might have a hack or some drainer on your account or some or some collapse of whatever exchange you're using you know like it's 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 still a, a dark forest um which we're kind of crawling around in yeah <laughs> actually there's this one point that you mentioned right um we are all like we see projects building for people in this local community that we have we call web3 uh we have this people building for people in the space itself um and that's kind of evident right uh, so are we are we saying that we kind of building for the short term bulla market quote unquote bulla market uh, or and we're not like actually trying to solve problems i i don't think it's that i think the people in the space are very intelligent they're very very smart and they're generally developers they're generally you can classify them as 20 to late 30 year old male developers and um i think when you lack a little bit of diversity in that regard um you get people building applications for a particular user so it's 20 to late 30 male developers um and um i i think there's an aspect of like we build applications for for us because we know how to do this we've we, we've been living and breathing this we kind of understand these kind of weird complexities and and the pitfalls and stuff um but someone on the outside looking in just sees a you know a a a path that is hard to follow safely fair uh and anyone else wants to add to that uh, i i mean uh i think I think we're just all gearing up for the next level of integrations uh when it comes to these Fortune 500 behemoths whether it be in uh whether it be in you know general tech or social media or even things like pharmaceuticals like serialization or or data integrity in general um so we we built the underlying solution now we're waiting for people to uh, adopt that not people but really large corporations to adopt these uh solutions but also on the consumer level side we are building out things like um aggregated yield and staking and earning rewards um you know traditionally like what you would find at a bank you know why when you hold assets in a in a mutual fund or a savings fund you earn 2 or 3% interest that's exactly what staking is right um on the decentralized side so we're building out all these consumer incentives um and uh digital economy incentives um but we are still waiting for that large influx of users um but as to James point i mean there is still a a severe lack in of user experience i mean whether it comes to whether it comes to uh wallets or um or even exchanges uh 
you know, Wall of Abstraction is doing a great, a great system here, a great thing here. Uh, but things like PayPal, where you know, send things to, you know, send the money to an email address, that's happening on crypto, but it's very slow to adopt. Uh, even things like um, ENS or uh, unstoppable domains, um, uh, these things are are in the space. We're just waiting for a slower and slower and more eventual adoption. But again, you know, it, it's it really is a big interoperability issue where you have to have an, EN, an ENS enabled account or an unstoppable domains account um, or enabled wallet rather uh, in order to send assets. Um, to these user enhanced user experience uh, accounts. So we don't really have a standardized set of, of guidelines of how a new user is supposed to operate or what they should really learn or what they should really do. Because whether you're looking at SWE or uh, Tron or EVMs, you know, such as Meta, uh, EVM wallets like MetaMask, uh, everybody has to do things a little bit different. Um, so I think it is, I think it is uh, crucial uh, and critical that we we really focus on user experience, um, especially going forward. True, man. On the user experience, I can vouch that like sometimes that you do not have gas, but you have the money in your wallet, right. and then sending that is like uh, pretty painful. Uh, I just want to add like one thing uh, in like what uh, everyone said that uh, there's also one issue on the funding side also as like crypto has like a four years uh, economic cycle. Uh, so that actually uh, pushes like uh, like they, they, that creates some pressure from like VCs and the guys who have funds to create a specific tunnel vision to get the product in that specific cycle. So I think once that breaks like in super cycle or something like that, that can actually help like uh, de developers and the builders to have little longer horizons and like focus more on the actual adoption. Yeah, agreed on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all of your points are like, you know, valid there. But so I think we are like at the end of our hour here. So I just want to quickly move on to, uh, you know, wrap things up. So um, just a couple of questions here. So to all of you, what are you excited? Like, what is the most important thing you're excited about for the next year and why um, in this space or maybe not in this space? Uh, but yeah, just let me know what is that important thing that you're excited, uh, that you're excited about for that's going to be coming in the next year or in this year at least. Uh, on my side, like I'm pretty excited about like the mainnet of Avail and the mainnet of HMDA is like uh, nice. like Avail is our preferred DLA and like with most of the integration, the default is Avail. So like once it goes live, it's it's like pretty uh, helpful for like uh, a lot of like the layer tools and the dApps, dApp D specific chains that are building on us. I wish you just you're just gonna start a, a, a wave of twin minute comments in the chat now. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I mean that that's good to hear. Um, you know, a wheel mainnet will be coming soon. Um, uh, yeah. So Sne, like Sne and James, do you want to add something? Like, what are you excited about? Sure. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm in the staking and and uh, liquid staking and liquid restaking uh, area. I'm really really excited to um, discover that there's a lot of projects working on it, but interoperability between LSDs and stream liquidity um, to solve this fragmented uh, problem, um, fragmented liquidity problem. Um, really really excited about you know uh, uh, Omni VMs in general. Um, so I, I think it's uh, yeah, just really excited about the staking space. I think it's it's growing more and more uh, every every single day. I feel like um, there's new projects and uh, new ideas being transformed and new user incentives. Uh, and of course, you know, Avail. Very excited for the, your your DA to actually go mainnet. Um, you know, I, I think it's really critical for for applications like like ours for uh, for a good solid DA layer. Um, to, to exist and, of course, uh, interact with. 
Yeah, um, I know Snare's been kind of talking about this a bit today. I'm also um, excited. That, like, I'm expecting a lot more um, institutional interest in this, ego- in this in this space. And I think part of that might be driven by the recent, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin trusts and and and, and Ethereum. Um, you know, more institutional investors uh, being exposed and curious about this. Um, and I think that might drive a bit more um, more people to join the space and to try it out. Now they see that it's not just some kind of crazy, weird um, Web3 thing. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out for the remainder of the year. Um, now that, you know, you can you can buy an ETF for Bitcoin, you can buy an ETF for Ethereum um, soon. And uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think institutional adoption is going to be one of the biggest game changes. That's like it's it's going to legitimize. I think Web three to the masses. I guess in a sense. Um, but yeah. So again, about the avail main and stuff. Also, <laughs> it's coming soon, guys. It's coming so soon. If you are watching this live, you want an alpha. I can't give you any, but it's coming soon. <laughs> Um, yeah, so our last question here, um, just for the listeners, um, all three of you guys, um, if, if anyone wants to contact you or connect with you, where can they do that and where can they learn more about your project? Yeah, sure. You could, you could learn uh, about us at helixlabs.org. Um, you could also reach out to me personally if you'd like uh, at snay at helixlabs.org. Um, and of course, join our uh, Twitter, uh, uh, you know, at ZK Helix Labs. And uh, you could also join our Discord, um, which will be linked on the website. Uh, and for Layerage, like you can uh, go to like layerage.io. There you can get uh, everything about the Layerage. And uh, we have the Twitter handle Lairish. You can follow that. And for like following, uh, contacting me on all of the social strike like, from Telegram to uh, Twitter, uh, my uh, like username is Ayush Biddle uh, from Discord, Telegram, Twitter, everywhere. So you can just contact me there. Awesome. James? Yeah, yeah. you can check out Subquery and subquery.network. Um, I'm sure you'll be sharing links and stuff as well. Um, but it's a pleasure to talk to you, Robin, and uh, be involved in this, this call. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for joining. This was Hot Takes Live, providing better infra in Web3. Mm-hmm.